So this is the masthead of William Lloyd Garrison's original abolitionist newspaper, but it's colorized because it's the Liberator Dot today. If ever a book was published entitled The Great Fables of Realism, then surely one chapter would be devoted to retelling the story of the Emperor's new clothes. The Emperor has no clothes. <laughs> Jacques Ellul would argue that that is a statement for the ages. If you remember the Hans, Hans Christian Andersen version of the story, two con men posing as weavers arrive in the city and announce to the king that they will make him the finest of all possible suits. They begin to work the con by, by miming the showing of, of a piece of fabric which they claim is the most exquisite in the world, but which cannot be seen by those who are either unfit for their position, or hopelessly stupid. The king is vain, and of course his courtiers as well will not admit to being unable to see the fabric. Instead, they fawn over the weavers, the fabric, the king. The weavers mime working the looms, cutting and stitching, and finally dressing the king in his skivvies before sending him out on procession after having received their payment and immediately skipping town. All the townspeople on the procession route also keep up the pretense. No one wants to be considered unfit or stupid. Finally, one lone child pipes up, the emperor has no clothes. That's all the permission needed for the crowd to see and say the same thing. The king flees in shame. We are in the middle of our final series, The Threefold Decision of Hope, that consists of waiting, prayer, and realism, written about by Jacques Ellul in his book, Hope in Time of Abandonment. Whether the realist says anything or not publicly about the nakedness of this world, he or she at least sees it clearly, acknowledges it fully, and refuses to believe that this current grand procession is going to end in anything other than than ignominy. My name is Lowell Bliss. Welcome to episode 51 of the Liberator Today's video series on hope. Here's an interesting historical fact about Hans Christian Andersen and the Emperor's new clothes. His manuscript was already at the printers when he was suddenly inspired to change the ending. Originally, the child and his outcry did not appear in the story. The procession continued and only the narrator and the reader were the wiser. Many scholars have speculated over what caused Anderson to go back and add the child and the declaration. Reportedly there was an incident in his own childhood. As a boy he was part of a crowd when King Frederick VI of Denmark was scheduled to walk by. The anticipation must have been high for the little boy. When the king finally appeared, the precocious Anderson said to his mother, Oh, he's nothing more than a human being. Hush, child, his mother reportedly said. Have you gone mad? Realists, I believe, have had little difficulty in looking at Donald Trump and proclaiming, The emperor has no clothes. But realists also look at the upcoming 2020 election and say, they are nothing more than human beings. They consider an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or a Joe Biden or the Democratic control of the House of Representatives. They think of the Mueller investigation and they say, oh, nothing more than human beings. In a lose day, the hot promise in Europe was socialism. Quote, today's ideal is socialism, he writes. It entices man once again into discourse without reference to the real and into action which is quite useless, but alas, not harmless, unquote. Jacques Ellul would have us be realistic about the whole human enterprise in a time of abandonment. It's nothing more than a human activity or happening. It's not the voice of God we have been longing for. In the last episode, we introduced Elu's declaration, this hope never consists in thinking that things will work out. It's a troubling statement, but let's zero in on the vague but inclusive word, things. 
It is a time of abandonment from God, Elu has argued in the 276 previous pages. It is a time when God is not speaking. Things. Political things, institutional things, religious things, activist things, human things, these things are not going to work out precisely because they are human things and naked things. They're not going to work out until dot, 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 God decides to show up again. And that's why we pray so fervently, Maranatha. The Emperor's New Clothes is billed as a cautionary tale about vanity, and it is. But it is also a tale about insecurity. Many, if not all of us, secretly believe that we are unfit for our positions, even hopelessly stupid. That's why we are such easy marks for con men, religious or political. In an Indian version of the story from the 13th century, the king of Srivasti is told that no one of illegitimate birth can see nor feel the cloth. We all want to belong. We long for a home. So the perils of vanity, insecurity, and isolation are there, but I believe that the Emperor's New Clothes can also be read as a cautionary tale about idealism. We want to believe the best about people, especially about skilled professionals like the weavers. Royal possession, processions rather, are supposed to be grand and glorious, not tawdry and silly. Kings are supposed to be smart and trustworthy, otherwise God wouldn't have appointed them as kings. This supercilious twit parading down the street in his underwear does not meet our ideal of the monarchy. And of course, if the majority of the people vote and see invisible clothes, well, our constitution is one of our most strictly held ideals. If we want to understand realism, we must be careful to not conflate it with pessimism. Realism allows for pessimism, and during a time of God's abandonment, it will more than likely come across as pessimistic. Elu believes so. But unlike pessimism, the opposite of realism is not optimism. The opposite of realism is idealism. Quote, without this I realism, rather, Elu writes, let me try that again. Without this realism, hope can only fall back into idealism. And it is my belief that idealism at whatever level is the worst of all traps represents the greatest danger for man. No matter whether it is the idealism of the man in the street, limited to a few simple judgments about happiness and taking refuge in the magazines of the happy life, or whether it is political idealism, believing in formulas and confused over words. Then Alou says in parentheses, quote, the best example of idealism was Hitlerism. It was actually a Great ideals set before mankind. I recall the hundreds of articles written between 1930 and 1936 stating the absolute necessity of setting forth an ideal for youth. Unquote. Idealism has its dangers. The fact of the matter, according to Elu, is that we human beings are useless at realism. He writes, quote, A man can never stand reality. He spends his time lying to himself, covering up the real, providing himself with illusions and rationalizations. This is what Walter Brueggemann has been teaching us. Now I'm quoting, now I'm speaking. This is what Walter Brueggemann has been teaching us when he says that when we encounter a harsh, harsh reality, we tend to choose denialism rather than realism. We would rather not face up to reality, just like Brueggemann points out about the Israelites in the Age of Prophecy. There is no way Yahweh would send us into exile, the Israelites rationalized. We are the, the chosen people. We have the temple and the law. When Hans Christian Andersen rewrote his ending, he may actually have chosen a false one, an idealized ending, because people can't handle a harsh reality. And so we'll double down on a denialism when presented with the raw truth. Remember his mother's response when the young Hans said of King Frederick VI that he was nothing but a human being. She didn't say to him, oh my gosh, child, you're right. She said, hush, child, have you gone mad? The villagers in the fable would likely have turned on the boy and said, hush, child, you are hopelessly stupid. Just like the Israelites turned on, say, the prophet at Jeremiah and threw him into a well. 
Trump supporters have turned on their fellow evangelical believers. Hush. Can't you see that Trump is like King Cyrus in his beneficial policies and like David in his forgiven adulteries? Trump is the anointed one. The tough persistence of denialism, fueled by a commitment to idealism, leads Brueggemann to argue that the only uh, that only something like grief can dissipate denialism. We need tears over our losses or potential losses to ever wash our eyes clear enough to see reality. But then Brueggemann argues that our next great fear and danger is that we will give in to despair. We now see clearly and can no longer, quote, think that things will work out. Here's where Brueggemann introduces raw and unapologetic hope mediated by nothing other than the person of Jesus Christ. Quote, God is a real character and an effective agent in this world. Those are Brueggemann's words that we speak directly to our despair. God is true to his promises. He will come again and speak again. That's Jacques Ellul's words that we speak directly to our despair. Hope, Ellul writes, quote, is not something to counterbalance pessimism and realism, to counteract reality clearly seen, understood, and grasped. Hope finds its substance in realism, and the latter, realism, finds its possibility in hope. Without a living hope, there is likewise no human capacity to consider the actual situation. Man can never stand reality. And he writes, quote, Without hope, reality becomes an unbearable mechanism, a continual damnation, a source of fear and apprehension which cannot be appeased. Man can never look situations squarely in the face, yet he is always frustrated and blocked when he fails to do so. The person who fails to look at the real, to accept it even in its most threatening aspects, to see the impasse or the fatality in which he finds himself, can never find a way out of it either can never surmount the reality, nor in any way get beyond it to make history." Unquote. So you cannot cultivate hope if you do not choose realism. But you dare not choose to be a realist if it is not part of the larger decision to choose to be a person of hope, which also means choosing the other two attitudes of the threefold decision, realism, prayer, and waiting. Next week, uh, the Decision of Waiting. I'm Lowell Bliss, Christian environmental missionary and climate activist. Thank you for visiting The Liberator today.